wanted to start off with a uh, case. This is a um, otherwise healthy 40-year-old uh, female with a 4-centimeter completely endophytic uh, mid-polar renal mass with a normal contralateral alkemia. The question here is, what, what would you do? And you know, like a great seductress, uh, a laparoscopic radical nephrectomy uh, is extremely tempting in this scenario. <laughs> For the uh, surgeon, it takes um, uh, you know, a couple hours to do with uh, minimal complications for the patient. Uh, the kidney cancer is gone and they recover fairly quickly. However, uh, Andy Novick reminds us that we should resist this temptation uh, and, con and consider radical nephrectomy only when nephron sp ser sparing surgery is impossible. But the question is, <coughs> when is nephron surgery, uh, sparing surgery impossible? Is partial nephrectomy feasible in a endophytic uh, left uh, six centimeter mass? How about a nine centimeter lower pole renal mass? Or a six centimeter anterior central mass? Or a three and a half centimeter completely endophytic uh, upper pole renal mass in a solitary kidney? Well, I believe all these cases are amenable to a partial nephrectomy. And in fact, almost all T1 masses can be managed with a nephron sparing approach. So before you ask me if I've gone insane, uh, I'll honestly say that I have. Uh, I mean, who doesn't like a Linderella story uh, like Jeremy Lin? But however, instead of spending the next hour discussing the uh, New York Knicks turnaround the past two weeks, I uh, plan to talk about briefly the AUA 2009 guidelines uh, provide a brief rationale for uh, partial nephrectomy, go through some of the more recent utilization trends, and really focus on uh, the concept of renal nephrometry or a standardized assessment of uh, renal tumors, as well as go through uh, my own personal uh, laparoscopic partial nephrectomy series. So with the increasing number of cross-sectional imaging being performed, the number of incidentally detected uh, renal masses seen by urologists is increasing. Current estimates report that 80% of renal masses are less than 7 centimeters in size. So in order to summarize the available data, the AUA has created a guideline for the management of T1 renal masses in 2009. For the otherwise healthy index pa uh, patient who has a clinical T1A tumor, uh, the standards of care have been uh, partial nephrectomy uh, when possible. In fact, that uh, radical nephrectomy uh, uh, can lead to an increased risk of chronic kidney disease, uh, which is associated with an increased risk of uh, morbid uh, cardiac events as well as death. So the man should focus on optimizing renal function rather than merely precluding the need for dialysis. Similarly, for clinical T1B tumors, uh, radical and partial nephrectomies are uh, considered the standards of care. So taking a step back, um, I'd like to look at the evidence and reasoning behind the recommendations for the 2009 AOA guidelines. First and foremost, the oncologic outcomes must be equivalent <laughs> if uh, partial nephrectomy is to be the standard of care. So based on retrospective studies controlled for a variety of uh, prognostic variables, um, cancer-specific survival is similar between partial and radical nephrectomy. This is a uh, large uh, multi-sensor uh, study involving about 1,400 patients, again, comparing partial and radical nephrectomy. And the cancer-specific survival is similar uh, between the two groups. And this holds true for T1A tumors, as well as uh, for T1B tumors. The uh, likelihood of recurrence is also uh, similar between uh, partial and radical nephrectomy for T1A and uh, T1B tumors. Further study at uh, Mayo Clinic and Memorial Sloan Kettering with over 1,000 patients uh, also show that there is a similar uh, cancer-specific survival and overall survival for this uh, group of uh, T1B uh, tumors. So with the meta-analysis uh, and the AOA guidelines, the uh, local recurrence-free survival is similar between partial and radical nephrectomy, whether it's done through a laparoscopic or open approach. <coughs> As well, uh, comparing the cancer-specific survival, there's uh, uh, not much difference between the groups. 
So given the similar oncologic efficacy between partial neurotic and nephrectomy, uh, there has been a greater preference uh, for nephron sparing approaches as there is more evidence emerging in the dangers of chronic kidney disease in patients undergoing radical nephrectomy. Uh, so we know that chronic kidney disease is defined by the National Kidney Foundation as a GFR of less than 60 mL per minute, or uh, if there's presence of kidney damage regardless of the cause. Uh, these findings need to be present for three or more months to differentiate uh, chronic kidney disease from acute conditions. So it's recommended that they're referral to be a nephrologist uh, if you're in chronic uh, kidney stage four, uh, preferably three. While poor outcomes for dialysis-dependent patients are well known, it uh, has recently become clear in a landmark study by Go and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine that lesser degrees of renal dysfunction are also associated with significant morbidity and mortality. The risk of <coughs> chronic kidney disease-related complications begins at an estimated GFR of less than 60, uh, at which an increased risk of premature death from cardiovascular disease has been observed. Most patients with chronic kidney disease will, however, not reach uh, end-stage renal disease or uh, stage 5 due to the high cardiovascular uh, morbidity. So therefore, as urologists, our goal must be much more ambitious than just precluding the need for dialysis, but rather we must optimize renal function. Here's an example of how uh, serum creatinine for assessment of renal function alone can underestimate uh, chronic kidney disease in our patients. This is a study from a moral Sloan Kettering of over 600 patients with a uh, normal serum creatinine of less than 124. And up to 26% of these patients actually had a uh, GFR, estimated GFR of less than 60 based on the MDRD equation. So it sort of shows that uh, a normal serum cranium does not necessarily equate to normal renal function and that chronic kidney disease in this population is uh, more common than we thought. The uh, comparison between renal uh, RCC patients and living kidney donors isn't necessarily uh, uh, similar and that uh, kidney donors uh, should have uh, a robust GFR and uh, have no um, diabetes uh, or controlled hypertension. <clears throat> Major finding uh, from this uh, study took a look at um, the a new onset uh, incidence of chronic kidney disease. It's found that after radical nephrectomy, this was uh, much higher uh, compared to a partial nephrectomy, both for new onset GFR of less than 60 or uh, less than 45. This effect of uh, radical versus partial nephrectomy uh, of new onset uh, chronic kidney disease is also shown in uh, multivariate analysis as well. <coughs> and so there has been also uh, studies recently showing uh, or suggesting a potential difference in uh, cardiovascular outcomes as well as uh, mortality uh, between uh, partial and radical nephrectomy. This is from a SEER database of uh, almost 3,000 patients with the renal mass is less than four centimeters. Mike, in that last case, was that adjusted for comorbidity? Uh, yeah, the the Charleston, yeah, the Charleston index. The last. Yes, but the one before that, where there's a huge difference. The 65 versus 20, is that adjusted? Uh, yes. Uh, no, no, sorry. This is just univariate analysis. This is multivariate. Uh, and similarly, there's been studies that suggest that there may be uh, a better overall survival with the partial nephrectomy compared to radical um, uh, from this uh, study as well. That at 10 years, uh, the overall survival from radical nephrectomy is 82% compared to a partial, which is 93%. So with all this mounting evidence of similar oncologic efficacy and the risk of chronic kidney disease, uh, what does the jury say about partial nephrectomy versus radical? In other words, uh, how often is partial really being done? So taking a look at the SEER uh, database again, uh, you can see that uh, over time, uh, partial nephrectomy has been used with increasing uh, numbers or proportions uh, here, especially for tumors less than 2 and uh, tumors between 2 and 4 centimeters. It's still relatively underutilized. This is especially so for uh, tumors between 4 and 7 centimeters that uh, less than 6% are being used, uh, partial nephrectomies are being used for earlier on in the decade. <clears throat> 
However, in tertiary centers such as uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, over the past decade, there have been uh, an increase in the proportion of uh, patients treated with uh, partial nephrectomy, both for T1A and uh, T1B uh, tumors. Also at Cleveland Clinic, over the uh, several decades, uh, ma uh, the majority of patients with uh, tumors less than 7 centimeters underwent partial, albeit uh, uh, their referral pattern has mostly been for uh, imperative instead of uh, elective uh, partials in these circumstances. Taking a look at a community-based health system in uh, Michigan, uh, over the past decade, for tumors less than 4 centimeters in size, uh, there's been an increasing uh, use of kidney sparing approaches compared to radical nephrectomy. This is also, there's a trend also for an increasing uh, use of uh, uh, kidney sparing approaches for T1B tumors as well. Taking a look at, uh, this is just an interesting graph uh, over the past decade of uh, what exactly uh, they got in terms of intervention. You can see here early on in the decade, uh, the, the use of laparoscopic radical nephrectomy uh, really increased, but over time, uh, partial nephrectomy, whether it be from a, an open or a laparoscopic approach, uh, here highlighted in green, has increased. They found that um, a higher volume, greater than 20 cases annually, as well as more recently graduating and fellowship trained surgeons had a higher um, rate of kidney sparing approach use overall. So the question is, which masses are still in being managed with radical nephrectomy? It's likely central masses uh, like this one. However, the uh, AUA guidelines encourage us to uh, consider partial nephrectomy for these challenging masses, and that it's technically feasible. <coughs> we know from uh, previous studies, especially at Cleveland Clinic, that there are technical considerations for these central masses. Uh, you can anticipate a longer clamp time as well as uh, an increased likelihood of a collecting system repair. Uh, however, there's no um, indicator that there's a poor, poor outcome in renal function or uh, cancer uh, outcomes. As well, uh, laparoscopically, these central tumors uh, can be uh, technically done, again, uh, with a proviso that uh, it's potentially increased risk of uh, uh, warm ischemia time as well as uh, early post-op complications here in a study from uh, the Cleveland Clinic. But the question is, what, what does central really mean? You know, when I was in LA, um, you talk about South Central LA, but you don't really know where the boundaries of that are. And similarly, in the urologic literature, uh, there's been no consistent definition of what a central mass is. Uh, does that mean a mass that's nonpolar, a uh, mass that's completely endophytic, one that abuts the renal sinus, or uh, one that touches the collecting system. So uh, this is where the uh, centrality index, or the C index, was uh, a, a, con a concept by uh, Indy Gill. And I'll, I'm just going to go through it here. Uh, this is basically when you take a look at uh, axial cuts of the kidney, you try to mark what the center point of the kidney is, and that's marked by an X here. Uh, and you can just keep scrolling through different sizes of the CT until you get to the center point of the uh, mass itself. Uh, from that, you can calculate uh, Y based on the number of uh, slices uh, and the cuts of the CT or MRI. And then from that slice, you can calculate X, uh, which is the distance from the center of the uh, kidney to uh, the uh, mass itself. So using a Pythagoras uh, theorem, uh, x squared plus y squared equals c squared, you can calculate c, which is the distance from the center of the uh, kidney to the center of the mass. And then the c index is a ratio of that distance uh, to the radius of the uh, mass itself. So it's somewhat confusing. <laughs> and so while the uh, mathematical premise uh, underlying the uh, c index uh, measurement is complicated, Actually, the practical um, C index measurement is uh, relatively simple. Uh, the average time required uh, to manually measure the C index is on the order of one to two minutes, according to uh, Indy. And after a learning curve of approximately 14 cases, inter observer variability is only 7% or less. And so, what does, what, what does the C index number really stand for? Um, we know that a C index number of zero 
basically equates to having the center point of the mass uh, be the same as the center point of the kidney. Whereas a C index of 1 uh, means that some point of the kidney mass touches the center point of the kidney. But uh, you know, C indexes of greater than one um, is not really known what the significance of that is. Uh, from the Cleveland Clinic series, um, they thought that a, a C index of uh, uh, greater than two uh, had a, a lower risk of uh, perioperative complications. And so the C index leads us to the concept of nephrometry, or a standardized approach to assessing renal masses. You know, during my fellowship in Chicago, before the use of nephrometry, we would basically eyeball a CT or MRI and then decide whether a partial nephrectomy was feasible based on intuition. Uh, it really reminds me of that scene from Moneyball. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a great movie. You should go see it. And um, it's basically a movie about uh, uh, the Oakland Athletics earlier on in the decade, in this era of uh, high spending uh, teams and, and trying to figure out a system uh, to to spend less but get more for what you get. And so there's a scene in this movie when all the baseball scouts are talking about the prospects and the free agents, and they're discussing whether he looks like a ball player or what his girlfriend looks like, because that can influence um, what, uh, what kind of confidence he has. But the, the, the Moneyball concept of systematically looking at players is really similar to nephrometry in that specific characteristics are standardized in order to better compare players and real masses uh, objectively. So there's two uh, systems. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is the PADOA classification. It's a rather ingenious acronym uh, from a group in Italy, in PADOA, uh, in northern Italy. And it stands for preoperative aspects and dimensions used for an anatomical classification. Now I'll just briefly go through this. Uh, it uh, gives a variety of points uh, for, again, location, the mass is exophytic, where uh, it's situated, as well as involvement of renal sinus or a collecting system, as well as size. I'll really highlight the differences uh, between this and the renal nephrometry score. Uh, they did show in their group of uh, about 164 patients that uh, the PDOA score was correlated with the predicting overall complications. However, uh, it's difficult to have any external validity for uh, points such as form ischemia time as they had no hyalur clamping, as well as for laparoscopic cases uh, since their cases were done all open. As well, um, very few patients had uh, T1B tumors, so it's difficult to ascertain any external validity for that. I'll focus more on the renal nephrometry score. It's um, a system developed by uh, Dr. Uzo in uh, Philadelphia. And again, it's probably the, uh, the, the nephrometry score that's used most often, probably because it's very simple to uh, remember and, and apply. So it's, a, it's an acronym uh, of uh, five uh, aspects, uh, four of which get points. The first one is uh, it's basically size of the renal tumor. And we all in, uh, know this. Uh, it's based on the um, T, uh, TNM uh, classification for renal tumors. So you get a point if the mass is less than or equal to the four, uh, two points between four and seven, and three points if it's uh, greater than two or equal to seven. So we know that uh, renal tumor size is a prognostic indicator of metastases as well as uh, prognosis overall. We also know that from studies that uh, size uh, is related to uh, uh, morbidity and uh, perioperative complications as well. The E stands for the exophytic or endophytic component of the mass. Uh, to uh, outline this, um, the expected contour of the kidney is uh, uh, outlined here. And uh, you have to figure out what proportion of the mass is exophytic <coughs> compared to uh, endophytic uh, in, in the uh, kidney contour. So uh, if greater than 50% is exophytic, uh, then you, they receive one point. Uh, if less than 50% uh, is exophytic, you get two points. If the mass is entirely endophytic, you get three points. So as you can see here, uh, with these two masses, these are actually both score uh, uh, just one point on the exophytic uh, scale. Uh, 
Um, so it doesn't necessarily denote uh, you know, ease of uh, partial nephrectomy per se. It doesn't really comment on the depth of the mass per se. It's just more of uh, what it looks like uh, on the renal surface uh, capsule. Speaking of N, this is a clip from YouTube that I found. <laughs> so N stands for uh, the, near, the nearness of the tumor uh, to the collecting system or the renal sinus. And, uh, <laughs> and really it's based on um, uh, a distance uh, from the, the tumor to uh, the center part of the kidney. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the marks of uh, 4 millimeters and 7 millimeters was actually just chosen arbitrarily uh, just for ease of uh, remembering them uh, based on the <laughs> TNM staging again. As we know also from uh, studies before that uh, masses that are cortical or uh, uh, not close to the collecting system or sinus have a decreased risk of complications uh, with nephron sparing approaches. The A stands for whether the mass is anterior or posterior, uh, a designation uh, with the A, P, or X if uh, it's neither anterior or posterior is given at the end of the score. Uh, so no points are given, but uh, it does uh, influence potentially the approach that you would have. Um, here, uh, uh, some authors have advocated that <coughs> posterior tumors uh, could be approached through a retroperineal approach. And uh, we know that uh, this particular type of mass that's posterior, medial, and uh, upper pole, uh, uh, as outlined here, can be very uh, difficult uh, uh, location to get to, uh, especially laparoscopically. The L uh, relates to the location uh, relative to the polar lines. So it, it really denotes the longitudinal uh, 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 location of the mass. So in the renal nephrometry score, the polar lines are defined by uh, where there is a continuous rim of uh, renal parenchyma. So this is the upper polar line, uh, lower polar line, and between that uh, the uh, renal pelvis and the renal hilum essentially enter into the kidney. So you get one point if the mass is entirely above or below the polar line, two points if it crosses this polar line, three points if A, more than 50 percent of the mass crosses this polar line, <coughs> B, if part of the mass uh, crosses the axial uh, or crosses the midline of the kidney or C if the entire mass is between the polar lines. And the, the easiest way to assess this is using coronal images but if no reformats are available it can still be assessed using axial uh, images. Uh, here you can see that uh, this slice is between the polar lines uh, because uh, there's not a complete rim of renal parenchyma. Uh, it's in, interrupted with uh, this, uh, renal sinus fat or a hilum versus this slice in the axial line is below the polar line because you can see that even though there's some renal sinus fat there, uh, there is a complete rim of renal parenchyma around it. Again, uh, using a coronal uh, image is uh, probably the most straightforward way to assess the uh, L component. Uh, again, it does not necessarily, uh, in, you know, uh, really say uh, whether uh, the mass is uh, endophytic or how, how deep it goes is this, this mass itself is scored uh, an L component of 1 is that uh, the polar line would be up here uh, so it's still it's entirely below the polar line. The Hyler or H designation uh, again has had uh, variable descriptions throughout the urological literature. Uh, some people have said uh, if the mass uh, touches uh, one of the first order branches of the renal artery or vein, oh, or if it goes within five millimeters of the uh, artery or vein. But for, um, for the nephrometry score, uh, they've said uh, a mass that basically touches the main renal artery or vein is considered a, a hyalur mass. So the nephrometry sum and score is almost like a, a Gleason sum and score. Uh, you can total uh, all of the components together and you'll get a number between 4 and 12. Uh, when reporting the score, it's uh, best to report each individual component uh, 
so that you know how each uh, component was scored and have a total with a, either an AP or an X designation of, of whether it was anterior or posterior. It's been grouped to uh, tumors that are low complexity, so they score a nephrometry score of between 4 and 6, uh, moderate complexity, which is between 7 and 9, and high, which is 10 to 12. It's really unlikely um, or uh, unusual to get a, a, a sum of 12, because that really denotes uh, a mass that's 7 centimeters or greater uh, and completely endophytic. So comparison, uh, comparing the PADUA and the renal nephrometry scores, they're very similar for uh, in many regards. There's just some slight differences. Uh, the PADUA score uh, uses the uh, sinus lines uh, to determine longitudinal location, and that's really uh, uh, based on the uh, presence of renal sinus fat. So comparing that to the polar lines and the renal nephrometry score, the uh, sinus lines tend to be uh, more superior and inferior compared to the polar lines. And basically, they just made that differentiation based on uh, uh, ease of identifying uh, those structures on, on CT or MR. Again, um, a very minor uh, point between the two classification systems. The PADUA score uh, incorporates uh, renal sinus and uh, urine, uh, urinary collecting system involvement uh, in separate scores and don't necessarily assign a uh, distance uh, to those um, uh, landmarks of the kidney. So there's been a number of studies taking a look at um, whether these scores can predict for complications, uh, as well as a number of uh, AUA abstracts. And the um, this study took a look at uh, both PADUA and the renal nephrometry score, and uh, found that a PADUA score of greater than or equal to 10, or renal nephrometry score greater than or equal to 9, uh, increased the risk of complications. As well, they found that the warm ischemia time was also predicted by both the the uh, systems. This is a study taking a look at um, how reproducible uh, these scores are uh, among a variety of reviewers. So they took 95 patients uh, uh, with films done about 10 years ago, and there's six reviewers. There's two staff urologists, uh, one a staff uh, a radiologist, uh, one urology resident, and one radiology resident, as well as a medical student. And um, the only instruction they got was um, to take a look at the website www.nephrometry.com and uh, that was basically their online tutorial and then they went through all these uh, uh, films. Not surprisingly, uh, tumor size as well as the R component uh, had the uh, most uh, level of agreement as well as the uh, L component. There's only moderate agreement for both the uh, exophytic nearness as well as the higher component of the score. Overall the agreement was moderate uh, at 0.75 and they found that uh, the mean uh, nephrometry score for those undergoing nephron sparing surgery was 7.2 versus 9 for uh, radical nephrectomy. Taking a look at uh, whether CT was used or MRI was used, it was interesting to note that uh, with MRI uh, there was less agreement, especially in the uh, end component, uh, compared to a CT. I thought that this may be related to the quality of the, the MRI images 10 years ago. Um, they also looked at uh, the influence of uh, the tumor size on the effect of uh, the other components of the uh, renal nephrometry score. So as the R component increases in uh, in, in size. Uh, other components, especially the uh, exophytic, uh, the N, as well as the higher uh, uh, scoring, uh, tend to have less agreement. And we know this inherently because as tumors um, increase in size, they can uh, distort the renal anatomy uh, and make, uh, make that grading uh, more difficult to do. So when they were taking a look at uh, patients with clinically localized uh, renal cell cancer uh, and try to take out the uh, R component or the size component and see if the remainder uh, of the renal nephrometry score was associated with any uh, adverse events. They found that it was still associated with distant metastases as well as death from renal cell cancer. So they suggested that perhaps the anatomical details of renal tumors apart from size uh, 
uh, may be associated with metastatic potential. However, I'm not too sure if this is necessarily the case because, again, we know that with increasing size, that can inf often influences um, what uh, the component they get on the N as well as the L. So even removing the R component doesn't necessarily uh, remove or exclude the, the influence of size on, uh, on the nephrometry scores. Other technical considerations uh, for nephron sparing approach uh, when uh, that's not included in these scores is the amount or the, the characteristics of perinephric fat. Um, I find that's probably the most uh, tricky thing to, to do a lot of the times, especially if there's a very adherent perinephric fat to the renal capsule. And if there's been a history of previous renal retroperineal surgery, previous ablation or biopsy, um, the presence of a renal arterial stent and uh, uh, where you would uh, put uh, your renal hyalur clamping, as well as renal anomalies such as uh, horseshoe kidney or uh, Alzheimer's dominant polycystic kidney disease. So it was, a, it was a good opportunity to kind of go through my own series over the past two years and uh, it's uh, interesting to take a look at this. It's um, done 43 uh, laparoscopic partial nephrectomies. The mean size was 3.7 centimeters. The uh, mean renal nephrometry score was 7.5 with five of them uh, being higher. Uh, mean warm ischemic time was 23 minutes. Uh, there was one positive surgical margin that was early on in uh, in uh, the course of things, uh, also a retroperineal approach, uh, so the hemostasis was uh, not as good as my transperineal approach. In terms of complications, I've, I've not had to transfuse anyone yet. Um, I've had a one urine leak that was in a patient with uh, clot colic and uh, subsequent hydro. And I think that uh, likely exacerbated or uh, uh, caused the urine leak. In terms of uh, complications, um, one patient had uh, uh, hypertension uh, that's controlled on antihypertensive medications afterwards. I thought this is likely secondary to um, potentially renal artery stenosis. This was again early on uh, when I was using a, a Debakey clamp and I clamped just the renal artery alone. There may have been some tr potential trauma to the renal artery at that point. There's been three patients with um, uh, clavian three uh, complications. So two that required a uteral stents, one for the urine leak uh, mentioned above, as well as another for a patient with clot colic and hydronephrosis, um, where I felt a uteral stent would, would be helpful there. Uh, it was one patient with a pseudoaneurysm. Um, she presented with a delayed uh, hematuria about three uh, weeks post-op, uh, and um, felt uh, it was a challenging uh, tumor, 